Uh, <laughs> let me first just uh, welcome all, all of you to this uh, ISS talk. Uh, we are, of course, located on the other campus, but we decided to have it here because I think it's easier to get people to get uh, to this location. Uh, the genesis of this talk, um, Professor Raja Mohan, who <coughs> is with the Observer Research Foundation in Delhi, he visits ISS every year, so he spends about a month, two months uh, every year. And uh, we also then found out that um, Professor Paul Evans was in town. So we were thinking that there's a lot of discussion, obviously, about, I mean, you cannot run away from the India-China question. Everywhere you turn, sometimes even if you want to, you cannot escape. Um, you know, on TV, opinion pieces, academic journal articles. So we thought, what we do is, we'll get uh, one perspective from Professor Raja Mohan on India, and uh, one from, on China from Professor Paul Evans. The, if you, just as a brief introductory comment, just to set the context, if you look at the kind of commentary that you read in, say, uh, places like the Economies and you know, Hayes Economic Review and also some academic journal articles, in the last one or two years, there's, a, there's always a question that comes up in a lot of seminars. What is the Indian worldview? What is the Chinese worldview? Because I think we all assume that we already know the American worldview. I think a lot has been written about it. We lived through the Cold War. So I guess people assume that we already know the American worldview. So there's always a huge uh, demand for the question, what is the Indian worldview and what is the Chinese worldview? So in this particular context, I think some people have, people have been following this. Recently, the Chinese came up with something called the Maritime Silk Road Initiative. And some commentators are seeing this as a kind of China's vision for how he wants to shape regional order and world order. And then associated with that, the question then always arises, what is the Indian reply, if you must, to the Chinese kind of vision? Should the Indians have a reply? Do they need to reply? And so these are the kind of questions that come up. So that's kind of context I thought we framed this uh, discussion. So I don't, obviously don't need to introduce Professor Raja Mohan. I think for those who unfortunately don't know him, the write-up is in the bio. Um, so what I don't understand between Raja and you. So I ask Raja to maybe speak for about 15, 20 minutes and hopefully by then Professor Evans would have made his way here. Raja. Thank you. Thank you, Sindak. And I think uh, as we wait for Paul, uh, of course, China is not going to disappear from the talk. So which is, uh, whatever you debate on Asia today, I, mean, I think China is quite, quite central, uh, whichever way you look at it, whether it's economic, security, politics, I, mean, I think China's centrality uh, today is, is so obvious that I think uh, it's always going to be the, the ghost in the room. I mean, and, and we have to uh, wrestle with the uh, challenges that, that China poses. Uh, before I uh, proceed, and I think it's, it's important to note that uh, the idea that India is in competition or a rivalry with China, I and mean, I think uh, that is something I think that's, that's beginning to change uh, in my view, that, that India-China cooperative dimension is going to be as important as the presumed competitive uh, dimension. I think we've seen uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping make an early visit to India. Uh, that was in September last year. You know, Prime Minister Modi will go there in, in, in uh, May. Uh, in, in many ways, while there are problems in India-China relationship, I think on the economic front, Again, I think it's, it's looking up in a very, very interesting way. So I wouldn't uh, absolutely presume I mean, that, that we, our policies will have to be defined or shaped uh, as, as a response to Chinese policies or as a, a competition to Chinese policies. But I think but, but, the, but the issue is, I mean, China shapes the not just Asia and the world today. So whatever one, one does, all countries in this region and beyond, uh, we'll have to integrate China in, into their into their worldview and, and deal with it uh, in an appropriate, the most appropriate manner possible uh, for for each country. But I think the the central topic, of course, is is on Asia, Asia's future. Uh, what does India do to shape uh, Asia's uh, Asia's future? 
I think uh, Asia uh, has been uh, quite central uh, to contemporary India's imagination, and I think the emergence of modern Indian uh, territorial state or the modern Indian identity, you have to use that word, uh, has, is, is deeply tied to uh, what happened in Asia, and how Asia influenced, uh, the emergence of Asia influenced India, and how India uh, influenced Asia. So uh, whether it was the, uh, you can go back to Tagore and talk about Tagore's ideas of uh, Asian unity, or you talk about Modi and, and his talk about the Act East policies. So one way or another, I think for nearly a century, uh, Asia has been at the very center of uh, uh, India's uh, understanding of the world and, and, and very uh, critical theater of its uh, diplomatic uh, engagement with the, uh, with the world. Uh, what I thought I'll do is really to, to, to look at uh, three broad issue areas and look at where India comes in into the uh, engagement uh, with, with, with Asia. I think uh, these three broad areas are, one is the whole question of Asia, Asian identity. The second is uh, the future of Asian economic integration. Uh, and third is the, the question of uh, Asian security order, what kind of a regional security order are we going to, we going to construct. So essentially, so this, I'll, I'll, I'll see what, I'm mean, going to try and explain what India's uh, policies in these three domains are, how they evolved and what are the kind of challenges they, they face in the, uh, in, the, in the coming years. First, I think uh, the, the, the idea of Asian, no, Asian identity, you know, I think uh, how Asia has figured in India's uh, national consciousness uh, over the last uh, century or more. I mean, I think, uh, so most textbooks on Indian nationalism, of course, uh, refer to the 1905 war between Russia and Japan and the victory of Japan uh, as the stirring of uh, Indian nationalist consciousness. That, that an Asian country could defeat uh, a, a, a European country uh, was seen as, as, you know, that the, the question of uh, uh, the being in, in the colonial period, that, that actually you could see uh, that possibilities that, look, it's not a permanent condition that Asia is going to be forever subordinate to Europe or European colonial powers. So, so uh, whatever the, the specific context of the victory was, I mean, how that victory was interpreted in India and, and much of Asia that as the first country to build capitalism in Asia and the first country to build a modern contemporary state, that China's you know, victory or uh, Japan's victory or Russia was a powerful impulse for uh, nationalism uh, all across Asia. And I think we, and that I think has, I mean, I think that's where the story begins if you want to uh, go back to the, to the beginning. And then of course you had the, the first discoveries of Indian influence in Southeast Asia and East Asia and beyond. So uh, whether it was going back to Asia Society, Asiatic Society of William Jones or the great Indologists of Europe who came uh, to Southeast Asia, discovered the interconnections within the region uh, of Indian influences in Southeast Asia. Again, I think triggered the notion that look, that a glorious past is always useful to have a glorious past. That, that the notion that look that you're inferior to the to the Europeans, the idea that look you had an expansive outward uh, or, you know reach and connection, uh, I think restores you know you want to call it self-esteem, self sense of identity, that the connection that look India was not just a colonial state or a colonial territory, that it had a history, uh, it had a reach uh, in Asia. Then I think both in terms of national. It boosted the national self-confidence, uh, as well as, uh, even more interesting, I think, in the longer term, the interconnections between Asia, that Asia was not just India and the subcontinent. There was Cathay, there was further Indies, I mean, East, you know, Indonesia, you had uh, Indochina, but that there was something unifying Asia, that there were a lot of common threads. That discovery, again, I think, uh, was a powerful uh, 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 idea and that idea that was developed again by Tagore uh, on, in India and Okakura Tension, who they met in the, uh, in just before the World War I, where this notion that, look, uh, that Asia is interconnected, Asia is one. Uh, in fact, uh, those of you uh, who read uh, Okakura's book, in fact, the first sentence is a brilliant first sentence. It just says three words in it. It says, Asia is one. It's like, Asia is one. I mean, that is a, if you can write a sentence like that in a book, I mean, I think uh, this is great. Uh, but I think then, of course, his sentences get a lot more complicated after that. But each one brilliant in itself. But but essentially exploring 
despite the Himalayas, despite the distance, that actually there was a profound integration, uh, that the cultures of Asia uh, were united, and that, and of course, problem attention, of course, is defining it as in opposition to the West. I mean, that's a different set of issues that, that continue. But I think what we saw uh, that the engagement, intellectual engagement uh, between Tagore and Asian produces some of the first ideas of, uh, of Asian unity. And that continues through uh, the, the Indian, Indian national movement. Uh, and, and you see that reflected in uh, Nehru's decision to, to do the first Asian Relations Conference. So one of the first diplomatic acts of Nehru was to convene the Asian Relations Conference that takes place even before India is fully independent in 1946. Uh, uh, just when the interim government takes over Nehru as the vice chairman of the, in, of the in, interim government. So I think uh, uh, that you saw then the foundation was laid, I mean, in fact, for putting Asia at the very center of Indian uh, engagement with the world and the Asian Relations Conference provides. But I think uh, contrary to the romanticization of the Asian Relations Conference, but there's enough to romanticize there, uh, as well as the Bondi Conference that followed, but the conference also showed deep divisions within Asia. That it was not just about, you know, we're all brothers, we're going to now pick the theme of, you know, we'll Asia united against the colonial powers was, was a running theme. But there were deep divisions within Asia. And I think much of the policy of the 47 was really a struggle to come to terms with that. Uh, because even as India and China were talking about, you know, Asian unity, uh, etc. But the fact was, many small countries were afraid of India and China. In fact, the term Asiatic imperialism was coined at the time. Some of it might be very interesting and relevant at this point. <laughs> uh, but the dominance of will Asia, will China and India as a big countries dominate the region. And then there was a division over who should be invited. Because Nehru invites uh, everybody, including Australia uh, and, you know, Tibet. So you see, I mean, the Chinese nationalist government opposes uh, what the head of the Tibetans are not here. So what you saw very quickly, uh, that the story of, you know, we colonial uh, states now, what is this? We're going to rise, we're going to connect, we're going to defeat uh, the, the European powers and con construct an alternative order. I mean, that themes continue to run. Pretty quickly, the reality of divisions within Asia profoundly affected the ability to construct uh, any kind of cooperative uh, structure within, within Asia. And then, of course, uh, what should be the attitude towards international capitalism? Are we going to liberate ourselves just to go back and take it all back from Western companies? Or do we do something about socialism as a big idea then? So I think you saw both on economics as well. I and mean, there were deep divisions in terms of how, how you deal with Asia. And then India's own foreign policy, I think, you saw Nehru turn his back on Asia, largely post-Bandung, where he was quite out, outmaneuvered, I think, in many ways by Chavan Lai. And Nehru begins to turn to non-alignment, non-aligned movement, rather than the Asian idea, I mean, that, that you begin to think in a much bigger terms. So Asia begins to take a back seat. So it, it's only in the way, you know, until the early 1990s, I mean, when the look East policy, you see India steadily disconnect itself. Because occasionally there were Indian forays, for example, on the Cambodian question, after the Chinese intervention, I mean, and the Vietnamese intervention, uh, India is the only country in Asia that recognizes uh, the Cambodian, the Hing Samarin government. Uh, that, because we put off the ASEAN, we put off the Chinese, we put off the Japanese, I mean, everybody possible. And we were seen increasingly as a Soviet stooge, I mean, if you say, put it simply, uh, that, that India was really an extension of Soviet power, so therefore the whole campaign against India, India is part of the problem uh, in, 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 in Asia. So I think it, it required the Cold War's end to, to reconstruct this whole engagement between India and the region. And I think you saw India return to Asia uh, in, a, in a much more chastened form. Gone was the swagger of, of Bandung saying, look, India is going to lead Asia, that India is going to be the dominant power, India is the mother civilization for the whole region. To one, actually, now, India had to catch up with the Southeast Asian countries. I mean, you're no longer the one that's going to lead, but you're going to one, your problem is now catching up because you had fallen so much behind the rest of the region. So catching up, and therefore, uh, that India now was going to find ways of adapting to ASEAN, we were told a lot about ASEAN style, uh, you know, keep your mouth shut, don't talk too much, uh, don't lecture too hard, uh, the kind of advice that India was given in the early 90s. Of course, 20 years later, of course, today, I find the opposite problem. Why is India so quiet? 
Do you guys have a policy? Are you here? Do you want to deal with us? What are you doing? I mean, are you really, do you have your act together? So it's an interesting change. I mean, just in the 25 years of India's Middle East policy, from one of saying, keep your head down, you know, don't try to you know, say everything on everything, that, that to one today, people, the expectations of India, that India needs to play a much larger role. Uh, and, and I think that uh, question of, I mean, of Asian, uh, Asia's role, I think today you see Indian role in Asia uh, being uh, quite openly, explicitly debated, both on the security and the economic debates. And, that, and that's one of the reasons why you saw India now fully integrated into the, into the Asian institutions. And many of the ideas now that were very much part of an abstract idealist debate in the interwar period are today a reality. And that brings me to the second part of my presentation, which is on the economic issues. One of the ideas, curious ideas that, that grew in the interwar period was the notion of Asian Federation. That you're not just seeking you know, national liberation from the European colonial powers separately, but that you must construct a Asian Federation. The idea had some appeal, I mean, quite a lot of, uh, because that's also a period of, of you know, post League of Nations, there was this whole enthusiasm for international institutions, you know, you've got to look beyond nationalism, uh, all that uh, ideas. Uh, and the idea that, look, that Asia must come together, that Asia must federate. And Nehru himself, I mean, if you, you can take up any number of references uh, through the interwar period when Nehru begins to talk about Asian Federation, Tagore talks about it. And there are a lot of groups in Calcutta, in Madras, in different places, uh, essentially taken up with this idea of, of, of a Asian Federation. But of course, it, it didn't have a ghost of a chance, and I think once post-independence and post the Asian Relations Conference, pretty quickly you, you kind of, the idea goes back because the divisions, of the Cold War divisions, and intra-Asian quarrels have become so deep. So the notion of federation is largely laughed out of court uh, in, in, in Asia. But I think what's surprisingly is that 40 years later, 60 years later, you have actually Asia is today so deeply integrated that anyone could have imagined 60 years ago, 70 years ago, at the end of the war, uh, if idea of Asian unity, integration was a joke. But today you find, actually, Asia has never been as integrated on, in the economic domain as it is. And I think much of the credit goes to ASEAN, the ASEAN-led institutions, which actually produced, I mean, it, what ASEAN used to be, the Balkans of Asia, to actually take the leadership role and construct a significant uh, economic integration uh, that, that, is, that is done. Then I think, uh, then the question of how India fits into this. I mean, I think where does India come into Asian economic integration? But I think in talking about ASEAN and the post-war post economic integration, it's easy to forget the history of India's economic integration before independence. Because there's far too much focus on the Nehru era and the not. If you go look back at pre-Nehru era, uh, it was India that was British India, the undivided India, which is actually in partnership with Britain, if you like. I mean, you can call it colonial India, you want to call it Raj, you want to call it whatever it is. It was a combination of the British and the Indian resources that actually produces dramatic economic expansion in Asia. Opium war, which is the, I think, the beginning of a great trading expansion in this part of the world that actually brought China and India together in, in a commercial sense, created the foundations for the emergence of Singapore as a major hub between the two was largely constructed by the British, that, that the British expansion, by using the resources of India, human or otherwise, essentially provides the basis for a dramatic expansion of, of, the, of the Asian economy, of the connection of Indian Ocean. Much of this actually takes place uh, under the leadership of the Raj. And, and because Russia, I mean, Britain was its sole superpower, and Indian resources provided the basis for actually uh, integrating. But then, of course, uh, it's, it's a politically not correct of me. You have to dismiss this as imperial, imperialist-led integration. <laughs> but the fact is, but it was nevertheless uh, integration, uh, and it produced that interconnections within the region. Uh, of course, then what wrecked it was not as much the the imperialist plot, but it was the once the Chinese and the Indians turned inward in the 1950s. You had actually the system actually collapse and that the integration broke down and ASEAN had to come in and step in 20 years down the road. But the big, two big economies turned socialist, wanted to build socialism in one country, consciously, deliberately, by choice, by design, uh, disconnected China and India from, 
from the region. There was Mao Zedong's policies there, or Nehru's policies in India. Uh, that essentially the strategy was to build socialism in one country, in, in one, a third part between the Russians and the Americans as well, that the, uh, you've got to be big to make big mistakes. And I think uh, India and China made huge big mistakes. But the fact was, uh, China turned back into an integrative phase, post-78, and that sets a whole new phase for, for the region's uh, integration. And then India starts uh, fully 15 years later, in 1992, when India begins to reconnect. So I think today, I mean, you see uh, India's uh, is better connected economically today, and connectivity is still the dominant theme. India is better connected to Asia today than it was between the 50s, post-independence, to uh, early 1990s. So, uh, but, but India still remains somewhat of a reluctant trade partner. I mean, I think when I mean, you, know, you talk to any ASEAN country, they've got constant complaints about India's Commerce Ministry and its negotiating positions, uh, that it's really being dragged, kicking, and screaming into the free trade arrangements. Uh, because it's largely about the domestic politics and the domestic consensus on how far are you going to globalize and how far are you going to reform. But I think the challenge is going to get bigger and bigger because uh, with now the RCEP, uh, with uh, TPP, and China's proposal for even a bigger free trade area, the question is, can India stay out? Or does it keep up with the Joneses? How does it do it? So, so I think it, it's no longer an abstract, limited uh, question, but I think uh, it's, it's going to dramatically uh, increase the pressure on India to 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 deal with this question of how does India link its economy. While it's today far more globalized than, than before, it still has to connect uh, because Asia is moving faster than India has moved. So this is going to, I think, a fundamental challenge for, for India. When India is, never been more integrated than it is today because 50 percent of its GDP is linked to imports and exports. But yet the demands that the TPP, the RCEP, the others make uh, will demand even a faster globalization, faster economic integration. And that, I think, uh, is, is, a, is a major uh, challenge for India that has to deal with it. And then on top of it now, uh, Sindhar referred to the Silk Road. It's not just the Maritime Silk Road, there's also the Overland Silk Road, and the Chinese has always had a nice formula. It's called One Belt, One Road. <laughs> Easier to remember than uh, One Belt refers to overland trade corridors that connect industrial corridors. So it's called Silk Road Industrial Economic Belt. The other is the Maritime Silk Road of the 21st century. These are the formal names, but One Belt, One Road is pretty simple. One Belt is about overland trade connectivity, and Silk Road, of course, is the mari Maritime, you know, the Road is the maritime road, is a metaphor is a bit mixed uh, on sea. Uh, but nevertheless, when you get the drift, I mean, it is one belt, one road, overland, maritime. So that is the basic framework. And I think this has put India, because India is a slow boat, as, I said, as we said on the economic front, whatever, I mean, we're not saying it's right or wrong, but how does India now, the slow boat, react to uh, the new Chinese proposals on, on, on uh, Silk Road, both on land and, and at sea? Uh, India's temptation, of course, has been to essentially uh, spin it out. I mean, easiest way of doing it is set up a committee, uh, a study group. Uh, that's what we're doing on the overland trade corridors. On the maritime side, of course, India is still deeply ambivalent uh, about uh, actually how does it deal with. Uh, some people think India should respond. Some people think India should have an alternative. But I'll come back to that uh, at the end. The third uh, area, of course, is the, is the Asian security order. How does India uh, relate to this? Yeah, this, this idea now that, look, India is a net security provider in Asia, Indian Ocean is a, is a common phrase. But I think this is really, this is not entirely new. I mean, you go back to the 19th century, uh, and even before, actually, that India was the security provider in this part of the world. The Indian Army, Singapore was blessed with two of them, uh, uh, in the, in, at least in the, in the Second World War period. But the fact is, even a century before that, the Indian uh, uh, armies uh, were the main provider of security, and the undivided India's armies uh, were the main uh, provider of security. And I think the earliest, for example, the earliest Indian expeditionary operation goes back to around 1780, when Indian troops came from Chennai to Philippines to bash up a few Chinese. I think that's basically where it was. Now, this story, so, so it's not as if it is something new, but the imperial tradition, I mean, that, that India was the uh, principal security, security provider. But I think the post and interwar period, I mean, again, it was uh, one million Indian troops in the Second World War, 
that well, the Americans defeated Japan in the island hockey. First World War. Both, both First World War. I'm coming to the because First World War, Indian armies didn't participate much in the. There was no Asian theater in a, in a serious sense. There was the Middle East, there was Europe. The Second World War, the, the East Asian theater, uh, actually it was called the Burma China India Theater, you know, in which Indian actually a uh, million troops were mobilized, out of which 800,000 were Indian. It also had one Mr. Obama there, Obama's grandfather. I don't know if you've heard his speak in Delhi, he referred to. His grandfather came as a cook uh, with, the, with the Indian Army, and he refers to that. But because the Chinese, the British were mobilizing <coughs> troops from all over the Commonwealth, because you had to push the Japanese out of Burma. Those of you who ever go to Rangoon, go see the war memorial outside. The biggest war memorial is with the Indian Army uh, out there. So I think the Indian role in shaping the post-war order was, was a dramatic one. But it's been politically incorrect for Indian post-independence to talk about it. So what you have is actually the role that existed, the Indian political class does not talk about it. I suspect the present government might change some of that, but the fact is that India was quite critical to defining the outcomes uh, in the in the Second World War. And and I think, so so what you had was, one was this legacy of the Raj, I mean, that as the security provider. The other was the national movement, which was increasingly uncomfortable with the military role beyond borders. So you have the nationalist movement beginning to oppose use of Indian armed forces outside, and the tension between the two comes to a head in the Second World War, where the Congress party, in a typical classical way, says we are for fighting fascism, but we won't support it. But of course, Indian support was mobilized, fully mobilized, uh, in defeating the uh, Burmese and pushing the Burmese out of, sorry, Japanese out of, out, out of Burma, to the Indian army that was taking the surrender of the Japanese troops in Singapore, uh, in, of course, Rangoon, <coughs> Singapore, uh, Jakarta, and all the way up to Hanoi. So it was the Indian troops that actually pushed the Japanese out. But the fact is, uh, for, the, for the independent India then, uh, it was one of staying away from this. And it's only now that you're beginning to see India fully integrated and into the debates on Asian security, but through the East Asia Summit, and before that, the talking shop called the ARF. Uh, but now, I think, the notion of India as a central piece, that India is a swing state, that India will, must contribute in some form to uh, shaping the Asian security order. Now, it's, it's a fairly widespread. And the fact is, the debate is largely uh, how does India fit into it, and what does India do at the bilateral level, at the, for lack of a better word, a mini-lateral level, that India sit with Japan and US, India sit with Japan and Australia. What does India do to restructure the regional security order? And then, of course, the multilateral uh, domain in terms of the East Asia Summit and the whole range of new institutions. Uh, because if you live in Singapore, I mean, I lived here for some time. Word architecture used to come out a few years <laughs> all the time. So when so the architecture debate is not over. So where does India fit into this security architecture? Everybody has favorite phrases, enclosure, what, whatever. So, but but basically the question is, how do you deal with the Chinese power? I mean, put it simply, the China's rise has fundamentally <coughs> altered the, the, the geopolitics, geopolitics of the region. A Chinese power today is the second largest economy in in real terms number one economy in PPP terms, the second largest military spender. So the Chinese have transformed the region's politics, and which in turn has created problems between China, Japan, China, US, China, ASEAN, you name it. So where does, how does India fit into this? And I think this is the real big questions on security. Here I think, debating those I think are, are, are but it's, like, it's, it's just the beginning of a debate on how India fits into this, of course, is something uh, we, we're going to see in the, in the coming years. But let me conclude by, uh, essentially saying that one, that India today has a chance to reclaim a role, not in, in terms of leadership, <coughs> but as someone which can make an important contribution to structuring a very different issue. I mean, I think uh, the second is that uh, that the main challenges for India are largely internal, not external. In fact, the region, unlike in the case of China, many countries here want India to play a larger role. Uh, so, China, but the problem is, how does India internally define its role the region, on the economic side, on the strategic side, on the security side, uh, is the uh, is the is the big challenge. And then, how does India manage the contradiction between the need to do more economic cooperation with China, but at the same time engage in some kind of a competition? But how do both the stands? How does it manage both the stands? Or how does it relate to China-Japan tensions? Because you go back to the Second World War. I mean, I think in the interwar period. India actually 
was supporting China against Japan. And in fact, Indian, it was Indian resources that were used to supply China against the Japanese when the nationalist government was sitting in Chongqing. And it was a Stilwell Road that was the So the Americans, the Indians, and the Chinese were working against the Japanese. Of course, now, in a different context, we don't know what the game will be played. But the fact was that the Indian resources were critical in supplying China when China's eastern coast was occupied by Japan. And you had Tagore, and most of the Indian National Congress used to do this annual, sorry, every month they used to do it in Omni <coughs> Valley, opposing Japan's occupation of China, boycotting Japanese goods. So there was a whole mobilization in favor of China. But today, of course, uh, the situation could be somewhat different. But the fact is, so this is not a new question that India had to deal with. And Nehru, of course, took a position that, look, neither should be isolated. That was Nehru's position. Japan, as a defeated country, said, look, Nehru refused to claim reparation against Japan and say, look, you can't isolate Japan. And at the same time, he told the West, look, don't try to isolate China. China is going to be very important. So in a sense, actually, India was saying, independent India was saying, look, China and Japan are both important for any stability and security in Asia. And I think that position should largely, I think I would say, India can continue that position of engaging both and doing both. And finally, uh, does what, what independent role does India do while it draws closer to America at one level? How does it deal with China? Is there a choice we have to make? Or can we play both sides? Can we be non-aligned? Can we build asymmetric relations, more economic cooperation with China, and more security cooperation with the US? So I think the multiple possibilities open up for, for India's foreign policy. But the problem is still, internally, how far the lag between India's expanding role, objectively speaking, <clears throat> and the subjective capacities of the Indian political discourse at this point in time, that is the world's overarching question. Thanks, Raja. Thank you. Uh, just want to welcome Professor Paul Evans. I think there was a slight miscommunication. I think he thought he was starting at 11, but the important thing is that he's here. So I'll hand the floor over to Professor Evans. I'm not going to introduce you. Who am I? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they have a bio in the URL, so I just pass the floor on to you. I think they're all waiting to hear from you. So. Well, thank you so much, and my apologies for. Uh, a late arrival. Thank you, uh, Rajiv and uh, uh, Professor Singh for inviting me to join today. Rajiv, you've been a <clears throat> valuable connector between India, Singapore, and Canada. Uh, so thank you for, for, for your efforts and the invitation to, uh, to be at what I thought was going to be a round table. I can see we have a round room, uh, but this is a, a, a format where I've I won't speak too long uh, because uh, Raja Mohan has just obviously set out a very big buffet in front of us uh, of issues for discussion. I'm, I'm thrilled to be with him, but I'm always nervous about speaking after Raja Mohan. He covers issues, particularly has a great sense of history. He has a, a, an academic's precision, but a journalist's sense of fun. Uh, in, uh, in a way that he presents things. And we've been, we've been friends for many years, and I've always thought that we're kind of polar opposites. Uh, Raja is an idealistic realist, and I'm a realistic idealist uh, when it comes to regional security matters and what might be done. I'm, I'm here, if it would be all right, maybe to talk more about the Chinese perspective and positions not as a China specialist. I, I spend a lot of time in China and with Chinese, but I'm not a China specialist. I work on regional security, multilateral institutions, and in that context, I've worked with some of the people here in this room, but over the last two years in particular, in a deep association with the Shanghai Institutes of International Studies and with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on an ongoing project on regional security order and cooperative security approaches. So these are views of, of not a Chinese, uh, not even a China specialist, but someone who, who sort of hangs out with them a wee bit and has been involved in some of the discussions in Beijing and Shanghai and at various meetings in China and regionally about Chinese perspectives uh, on where Asia is going. And I, I don't know your feelings, but mine is that the year 2014 clarified, uh, in many people's minds, some of the key dimensions of China's perspective on what Asia's future looks like 
and where China is going to be positioned in this. I think as I heard Raja speak about the complexities and the, in some ways, uncertain outcome of the discussions in India about where India positions itself in Asia's future. Um, we can, I think, now say with some confidence that we have a pretty clear idea of where Xi Jinping's government uh, would like to go over the next few years. There's a story that my Chinese friends like to tell, uh, uh, particularly those who studied in the United States, about the planning cycle inside the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but more importantly, in the Chinese foreign policy establishment. And their line is that um, when you have a new leader come into place, one like Xi Jinping, who's had, in the first two years, you expect some ideas to be discussed. There's a lot of conversation with the think tanks, with the ministries, putting ideas into the, into the new leader for years one and two. What they keep telling me is you watch what happens in year three and over years four and five to see what those ideas look like. And my involvement in this was being pulled into the Shanghai Institutes of International Studies with Yang Jiemian, some of you, some of you know him well, uh, at that early stage of the process, just when President Xi was, was uh, uh, appointed, uh, where his, the system of selection brought him in. And we were asked, uh, uh, as one of a number of processes, to say, come up with some big ideas about how China can be a constructive player in regional order uh, on multiple fronts. And as you all know in the Chinese think tank scene, there are dozens of experiments and conversations that have been underway. <clears throat> well, I think that in the year 2014, what was that, two years later after she was in power, we got a sense. And I would, I would paint two pictures of what Chinese view is of Asia's future based on what we have seen of Chinese action in 2014. And I think Raja began, as at least when I came in the room, you were talking about the economic agenda. And if I had to, if when I teach my students when we get into these topics, I say that if all the complications in China, watch what happened, the announcements that came out in November of 2014, at the time of the APEC meeting, the new infrastructure investment projects, of which there were three, the agreement with the Americans uh, on uh, climate change emissions. And it's, you know, Beijing has this capability to focus attention and make some big splashes. There were some big splashes at the time of the Olympics, but I think 2014 in geopolitical terms was, uh, uh, was the equivalent of the Olympic Games. A lot of money being spent, big ideas that look like they were spontaneous. The discussion of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank had been going on for more than two years, uh, privately in government circles and inside China. Uh, but the, the spectacular kind of fireworks of that week were, were pretty remarkable. And I would say coming out of that, what we can, what we can observe uh, is that first, uh, China is focus, is its neighborhood, is Asia. As important as U.S.-China relationship is, uh, for the reasons that Raja mentioned in economic terms, but in the, uh, in the big geopolitical picture, the U.S. matters uh, to China in fundamental ways. But I would say 2014 indicated that Asia matters too. And that much of the creativity, the energy, and the money that China is devoting is to its regional neighborhood. Not how you define that very. But if we, uh, uh, including Central Asia, the, the kinds of expansive ideas uh, on what to do with infrastructure, I mean, if China's 21st century regional order had one symbol, if what you were looking at is, what, what is China trying to achieve in this region? You could look at it through pictures of high-speed trains uh, as a symbol uh, of this expectation of a way, not just in trade relations, but the integration in a way that is, is pretty complicated. It's big, it's ambitious, it attracts imagination, it isn't as frightening as some of the other things China is doing in context of maritime disputes and other areas. This is one that even China's enemies, those who see China as a threat, have to see as pretty appealing. Uh, not perfectly, people, many different governments, many different uh, think tanks are trying to figure out what this really means. 
what are going to be the rules uh, of, of this new arrangement, how are decisions going to be made, a, a whole number of things. But as for a symbol that's something out there, those announcements seem to me to say that China is into this region with a pretty sophisticated strategy that avoids some of the geostrategic negativity uh, that other things that it could be doing want. This looks, and put it in Chinese terms, as a win-win strategy. Well, I would say big win for China for some of its domestic issues, and a, but a, also the possibility of a pretty big win uh, for a number of participating countries, uh, uh, ranging from Singapore, Laos, uh, the, the range Thailand, uh, but now into Central Asia, and maybe to India itself. So uh, I think we can, we can come back to this. What we see is the logic of China's involvement with regional institutions, the RCEP process, how it has been positioning itself with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, less negative than it was in past, but trying to avoid the conflict between uh, <clears throat> a China-centered regional trade, uh, uh, F regional FDA, the TPP process, when China made that very interesting proposal in November in, uh, in Beijing for APEC to do a free trade area of the Asia Pacific. An idea, by the way, that was Canadian 10 years ago. Now that it's picked up Chinese characteristics, uh, it's a little bit uh, more lively uh, at this stage as a proposal. I don't think it's a real game plan, but it was an idea of at least those who were trying to square the circle of competing regionalisms in the Chinese case. But let me use most of my time uh, to talk about where Raja left his presentation, which is on regional security and regional security order questions. And I think that in what we saw in November, uh, and is this okay, the sound? We're sort of getting a, do we need the microphone? How strong is my voice? I'm is, closer this, to the mic. is this better if I sit back a little bit? Or? Yes, be closer to the mic. You want yeah. me closer to the mic? Yes. Is this better now? Yes. yes. You've got to know your ears. <laughs> uh, you've got to know their ears. You've got to know the room. My apologies. Let me try and then focus on the regional security part. And I think we all are aware that for since 1994, 1995, China has become a participant in ASEAN-led regional security discussions. The ASEAN Regional Forum on the Track 2 basis, uh, later with the ADM, uh, the ASEAN Defense Ministers meeting, etc. China's calculation at that stage was that it was not a bad thing, this multilateralism, as long as it didn't get in the way of some specific Chinese objectives. That was not a lot different than American views and the views of other countries. I would characterize China's early involvement in these processes as being a participant mainly for defensive purposes, keep things from happening too fast and in ways that would undercut their interests. Um, I think that to fast forward to 2014, that we see a change in Chinese approach to what it wants from multilateral processes in Asia. Uh, and it's been a change from interested in architecture, just what the institutions are, to what should be the principles that underline a regional security order. Uh, China has invested in some of its own institutions. We've been in the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, that is uh, set up with a different set of players than the Asia Pacific and the ASEAN-led processes. Uh, China has been involved with that. But what is, what is, I think, is fundamental is that at this stage, China is looking at playing a leadership role in institutions that it creates, in institutions that it's a member of, and in institutions that it wants to be a deeper member of. And that, in particular, to understand that, it is about Asia. Uh, it is about playing a bigger and more acceptable role in Asia in a way that, and here is the hard part, is this new infrastructure, you know, architecture that China is investing in, is it intended as part of a strategic competition with the United States, uh, a way to wean Asian countries away from an alliance system uh, that is, um, uh, is still pretty fundamental uh, to this part of the world. 
is it a way to try and create alternatives for Asians to solve Asian problems? In the uh, SICA uh, meeting where President Xi gave his speech about what do we want from an architecture, he didn't say the only architecture is Asian, but he said we need more Asian institutions for and by Asians. You can, we can certainly see that emerging on the economic side. What it looks like in the political security side is open for, um, is open for discussion. But I think we see at least part of the Chinese motivation uh, and in some quarters an effort to produce a structure that is, if not independent of the United States, is separate from immediate American leadership and push. And so uh, that it's a, a kind of curious moment. What is, I would add, the, the, the last part of the presentation is on some Chinese thinking on a regional security order not the architecture uh, so much, the specific institutions, who does what, what are the kinds of issues in there. But what is the over, uh, overarching security order that might be put in place in the region? And here, I think that Chinese thinking is not yet fully consolidated, but that it is more advanced uh, and more sophisticated than our American friends' uh, views that underlie their pivot to Asia which is a combination of trying to maintain American geostrategic primacy at the same time that it's trying to encourage multilateral processes, some of them ASEAN-led, other kinds of processes. Um, there's, a, there's a tension that the Americans have not yet worked out because when it comes to the crunch question, at what time and what place would uh, a... Um, would the new multilateral processes start to erode the need for their own alliance structure? Americans have bumped into this question and are, are playing a game. The Chinese are trying to come up with some ideas that, again, square that circle. Um, our discussions um, uh, with them uh, over two years, and that we're now going to be advancing into the ASEAN Regional Forum's eminent persons group, essentially have to do with a regional security order uh, that is complex. Initially, the Chinese view was that a multilateral future for China could not just supplement, but could eventually replace an alliance structure system. That was the argument a year and a half ago when we began. That these were conflictual enterprises, but actually in the same way the Americans understand this. Uh, recently, their view has become rather different, that the two can in fact be supplementary, at least for, uh, for a period of time. That there can be ways in which the U.S.-Japan alliance, uh, Japan, excuse me, the U.S. alliance with Thailand, uh, with South Korea, can be integrated into regional processes related to search and rescue, joint training. Why not? Uh, do what NATO does uh, in some of these uh, uh, exercises and have other countries participate in the military activities of an alliance. I mean, this is a, in some ways a crazy idea, but we've seen it with RIMPAC recently with the um, expansion of some of the naval exercises. But the kind of question they're asking and trying to engage people in is, what could we do to see this nascent multilateral process strengthen? and at the same time connected to the alliance structure. Uh, I think that there are questions that the Chinese are trying to, uh, to answer uh, about uh, what kinds of measures for self-restraint uh, are going to be important going forward. And here's the paradox. At the time that China is talking some big and in some ways appealing ideas, it's practice is something that is, uh, sometimes raises questions. Is China being self-restrained in the context of the South China Sea? Uh, I don't know the views in this room, and I'm watching your faces. You're all, no one's going. We're not seeing any easy answers on this, on self-restraint. But I think certainly many American observers. Philippines. 
and the Philippines, uh, and the Vietnamese, and, but I think, importantly, a lot of Western observers see China as, as not exactly. If that's what self-restraint is, maybe we need something else. Uh, but nevertheless, at the level of now trying to define a regional security order uh, in a bigger way, the Chinese are active in thinking. And I'll end on one specific <coughs> institution that I, I thought today would be very useful as an intersection point between what Roger described as Indian thinking and Chinese thinking and American and others. And that's what is going to be the function of the East Asia summit process. This is a game that is, is not yet fully defined. It's uh, done certain kinds of things, but all of the architecture questions about what it's going to do, whether it's going to have a secretariat, where is the actual leadership going to come through, those are all part of the regional discussion. But the bigger question to me is what is going to be that, the role uh, of that East Asia summit in trying to move towards a new security order in a context in which, I don't know your views, but I think there are a lot of views in the region that American primacy, as it has been known for the last 50 years, is now unsustainable in this region. Well, not, it's not going to disappear. To, the U.S. is not going to disappear from the region. The U.S. is going to be but primacy. The idea of American military force being predominant, that its political capacity to uh, either intervene or to, to, to get involved in situations has made it uh, pretty much what Madeleine Albright called it, the indispensable power. I don't think there are many people in Asia that feel 20 years from now the United States is going to be the indispensable power. Important power, yes. Indispensable, no. Uh, and so in getting ready for a transition in an order, what should be the principles of a security order going forward? Security community is unimaginable, uh, just not in this region, but some kind of, we've been playing with phrases like uh, consociational security order. We've been working with um, Bilahari Kausikan recently had a piece where he talked about the need for uh, omnidirectional equilibrium. Who knows what that means? <laughs> Even Billet doesn't know what this means. But he said it, what he's trying to do is, is come to terms with this huge problem that the security order that has been built by and with the United States is going to change. Uh, might go in the direction of, of sharper alliances, more conflict with the Chinese. Most people in this region don't want that. They don't want it for economic terms. They want this, what Billa is trying to get at with omnidirectional equilibrium, is no longer balance of power in the way we knew it during the Cold War and in the context of military might meets military might, but more in the context of a multiple dimensional, a multi-dimensional game on balance of power that is on it, that includes economic factors. This is a region, unlike the Cold War in Europe, where the economic advantages to integration, to warm security relations are remarkable. This is the golden goose era uh, in this region. <laughs> nobody wants to see that disappear, and nobody doubts that in the future in this region, China uh, and India, uh, maybe a little bit scaled back, are going to be crucial. So how do you put this together into something that's distinctive? And we don't have the answers to it yet, but I would say that there's going to be discussion around this in the context of what should be the operational philosophy, the objective, the goal of the East Asia Summit. And some of us at least hope that part of that agenda is going to be the definition of a distinctive regional security order that, that, that is based on material forces in the region, but also looks forward to something that is beyond a, a balance of power, geostrategic, outright competition between the major players here. So maybe those are enough ideas uh, to, uh, to stimulate some thinking and discussion. I would end with one comment. One of the, I'm fascinated to have an opportunity to be with uh, uh, people who know a lot about India. Uh, and uh, Raja, our chair, many of you in this room. Uh, it's been a long time since I've lived in India and in Pakistan 15 years ago. So I'm way, way out of touch. But I can give you Chinese views on this. Not on the bilateral relationship. That's huge, multi-complex is being managed by very smart people on both sides, and maybe in some positive ways. But when I ask the Chinese friends, I say, in this equation, 
this new regional security order. We can talk about ASEAN role, sophisticated conversation on what ASEAN centrality might look like with evolved characteristics. Um, you know, when we talk about the United States, sophisticated discussion from the Chinese on where this might be. Japan, not so much on Canada. But most importantly, not so much on India, because the calculation is exactly where Raja ended his position. They say the Indians do not yet have a vision or a strategy for this big picture of what they would like to see the region look like in 10 years. They're being reactive, responsive, some ways defensive against us. Uh, they see this as uh, in, a, in, a, in a narrowly geopolitical competition mode. But in terms of this kind of more creative thinking about what would we want to desire, they haven't seen much Indian ideas, and they have not seen Indian participation in the existing Asia-Pacific architecture, ASEAN-led processes, as indicative or the signs, the synapses, that some of that thinking is taking place. So that in, in some ways, with my concluding, my concluding statement would be, China knows more or less, at least under Xi's leadership, where it wants to go in Asia's future. Uh, my suggestion is, at least through Chinese eyes, India does not know that yet. It's thinking its way into it. Raja Mohan might write the book that will influence Mr. Modi uh, and his colleagues to, uh, to take on this challenge, but it's not in place yet. Thank you.